I cried out to God for help. I cried out for, to God, out to God to hear me. I hope that you will give some real thought to the lesson today. We're going to look at a, a thirty some chapters of the Bible, and a typical thing is to spend about five minutes per verse. And if we do thirty chapters of five minutes per verse, we'll be done before next Sunday. And since we're having a pot like it's probably okay. But I want to deal with Psalm 77 all the way down through Psalm 107 and some of the highlights. But have you ever realized Psalms is a songbook of the Jewish people? And those of you that have been around for a while remember when they used to have the New Testament and Psalms and it was added to it because that's the Jewish songbook. And go back to your VBS days and you've got all the kids lined up. Maybe you were one of those kids and you sat there and and the song leader said, we're now going to learn the books of the New Testament. And we started out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the way through Revelation. How many of you even now, intellectually, when somebody says something like, let's look at Ephesians, we'll think Galatians and Ephesians. That's pretty normal because we identify with songs. And look at some of the old time commercials my baloney has a first name. We all know that song, that commercial, because of the song. Songs are important. And so as we get into this, we'll see the songs of joy, the songs of sorrow, the songs of request, the songs of, of acknowledgement, all of the different types of psalms that are in the book of psalms. Each one is called the psalm, singular, but together they're psalms. So when somebody says Psalm 23, that means just that psalm. As we get into the lesson now, we're going to skip over the first part since we had a good reading. But some of the messages that we can consider, and the first one is comfort to people from recalling God's mighty deeds. Have you ever thought of sometimes things are not going well for you, but then you remember how God is in charge and the things that he can do and the things that he has done? That gives us a lot of comfort knowing, by myself, I cannot do this. But with God's help, I can overcome, I can bless, be blessed. If we remember how powerful the Lord is, then that should give us comfort. I sat in a hospital room and a physician came in and told the lady that was laying in the bed, a fellow church member, that she'd been diagnosed with cancer and she had four to six months maximum to live. And the lady was probably in her 40s. She still had children at home just devastated. And she looked at the doctor and said, my God is a very powerful God. And if he wants me to live, I will live. And so whatever he says, I will accept. And the doctor looked and said, I wish I had that kind of faith. That's what we need to have is that kind of a desire and faith knowing if we live, we win. If we lose, we still win. And we don't lose, we just simply transition from this life to another life, and so it's a blessing either way. The psalmist made that very clear, but he also wanted people to realize that God's guidance of his people, even when they're not faithful, was very evident. And how often have we had that same thing happen when we look at the people of Israel and how they would turn away from God, and yet he would still guide them and care for them, and they would turn back and he would bless them? Just consider here they are, they've been in the land of Egypt for years and years and years. They travel through the Red Sea. Moses comes, he st stretches out his hands of the rod and the sea parts. They walk through in dry ground. They get all, all of them into the wilderness area. And the sea is closed and all the Egyptian, or I mean all of the, you know, the Egyptian soldiers and the horses and the chariots are destroyed. What's the first thing they do after that? And said, Praise the Lord, let's take some time and really have a worship service. They look around and start to complain and murmur. We had it better back on the other side. All we have here is manna, manna, manna. Now I'll, be, I'll confess to you that I don't like to eat leftovers six days in a row. And Maria always cooks for an army. And so I found that sometimes I like to invite people over just so I don't have to eat the same food day after day after day. But they were complaining, all we get is manna. Of course, he provided quail too. 
Their clothing didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. God still took care of them even when they weren't faithful. And because of their lack of faith in him, only Joshua and Caleb were allowed of all the adults to go into the promised land. All the rest died in the wilderness. God still cared for them. When we went to the promised land, the land of flowing with milk and honey, the nation was built up again and became strong and powerful. And a lot of good was done. So the Lord was with them even when they weren't faithful. Another aspect of this is God implored to rescue people from their calamities. How often does that happen to us when we just don't know what to do and we say, Lord, help us to get through this, whatever it might be. I don't recall the movie, but I recall seeing a clip of it and how a man was out in the ocean drowning and he made a plea to God, Lord, if you will spare my life, I'll give you 100% of what I have. And as he kept getting closer to the shore, 90%, 80%, 70%. And finally, when he got out of shore, he said, well, you had your chance. And that's kind of the way we do sometimes. There's a calamity, but when things get better, we tend to forget about it. God is one that cares for us and loves us. And we want to do things that are pleasing to him. And, and we beg him to help us in difficult times. How often do we thank God profusely for the good things that he's done for us? When something wonderful happens, how often do we get on our hands and knees to say, Thank you, God, for what you've just done. Thank you for this wonderful gift. That's a very important aspect of life. I suggest to you not only that, but there's some other things to consider. God's goodness and Israel's waywardness. They were traveling the wrong way and the Lord still provided for them. Now, I almost hate to say that with all the children here, but probably the most prime example of goodness in your life is grandma. You can get away with stuff with grandma that nobody else can get away with. You ask your parents. They never got to do a lot of things you got to do. We didn't get to go to McDonald's and choose whatever we wanted. We were told, you will eat this and you will like it or you go to bed. That doesn't happen so much anymore. We're, we do these things. But have you ever noticed when you go off the deep end and you're not doing right and you ask for forgiveness? Grandma especially is the first one to forgive. and. Grandpa will come through and mom and dad, but it's the point that they still love you even when you're almost not lovable. That's the way God is. He loves us even when we're not very lovable. He died, he let Jesus die for us that we could be with him forever. Another good aspect of this is the fact that we find that unjust judgments are rebuked. Sometimes things occur and we just don't understand why and we get very angry. But if we just let it be, the Lord will take care of this in its own time frame, and it all works out. It took me a long time to realize that God is the one that's the final judge. When people mistreated me, I wanted to just get even with them. But with my stature, I wasn't able to do that with the bigger guys. And there was no way to just fight back. And I dreamed of all sorts of things to get them, to cause them a lot of grief. And finally, I understood, just let God take care of it. Even in this life, if they get away with it, they're still going to give an answer. Put things in a proper perspective and realize the Lord is in charge. And those that misjudge, they're going to give an account for that on the final day. Have any of us ever made mistakes thinking that what we've done was, was something and it wasn't right? A true story of a man who was a sheep farmer. And he noticed that he had sheep missing on a regular basis. And so he decided to one night be out and hide outside and maybe he could catch the wolves and shoot them. While he was outside, he heard some noise and his dog came back and the dog had blood on its face. And he found a dead sheep and he took the dog out and shot it and killed it. And he was so heartbroken. And the very next day as he walked out to get the sheep, he looked and next to where the sheep was, was a wolf that the dog had killed. And so he realized, I made a terrible judgment and there was no way to bring the dog's life back. Sometimes we say things, we don't know all the details, it can be a problem. So be careful about those kinds of judgments. God is one that is inspired, we plead with him to confuse our enemies and 
He wants us to do things that are, are going to cause our enemies to be confounded, to get to the point of saying, what exactly do we need to do? Do you remember what Gideon did? He had 32,000 men, and the Midianites had 120,000. And so they're going to go to battle. How would you like to go into a battle with four of them to every one of you? And the Lord said, Gideon, you've got too many men. So he said, tell everybody who's afraid to go home. 22,000 left. Now it's down to 10,000. And it's 10,000 versus 120,000. How would you like those odds going into battle? 12 of them to one of you. And he said, Gideon, there's still way too many men. Go down to the brook. And he had those that were lapping water like dogs and others that were drinking. And he, he said, now, Take these, and 300 men were all that were left out of 32,000. 300 versus 120,000. Gideon divided them into three groups of 100 each. He had a covering over a torch. He put them in the mountains, and when the, the trumpet sounded, they broke the covering, and they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. The Midianites were so confused that they started killing each other as they were running away, and Gideon won the battle overwhelmingly. You see, it's the point that they were confused, and they didn't know what to expect. God is in charge. He's going to do things. David longed for worship. He looked forward to it. And I hope that all of us have the same feeling today. I hope that we look forward to Sundays, not because I'm preaching, but because you get to be together with your brothers and sisters. And even though half of you are still one family, I'm sure it's still a good time to get together and to be with one another. And to look out and to say, this is the day I get to be with my brothers and sisters. This is the day I get to be with those of like mind. And that's a very special time. I'm quite sure that there are some of you that would acknowledge that when you've had to stay home because you're not able to get out due to illness, you wonder, I wonder what songs are singing today. I wonder what the lesson's all about. I wonder who's there and who's doing what. That's because it's important to us. If we long for worship, it's never going to be a problem to be here. It's going to be a blessing. I think again of how they prayed for God's mercy upon the nation. This brother over here suggested today that we pray for our country. And I hope that we do pray for our country and realize that we need to pray for our leaders, not only of, of the congregations, but of the nation on a regular basis. Pray that they will make decisions that are pleasing to God and helpful for the advancing of the kingdom. Israel was one that was prayed for regularly by the prophets and others, and yet they still struggled a lot. They needed help. The privileges of, of being a citizen of Zion, just think of our pri privileges of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. We're the only ones that can really call God Father, those of us who are citizens. We're the only ones that really have brothers and sisters all over the world. We're the only ones that really can understand what it means to be forgiven because we're added by the Lord to his church, the kingdom, when we're baptized into the body of Christ. If we're added by God, we're part of his family, then we have someone special blessings and the inheritance for each of us. Hearing those words, well done. It's not physical things but the spiritual blessings of being with God forever and the peace of mind that we can have now. I think again of the petition to be used to keep us from death. If somebody is not doing well, is it wrong to pray that if it's the Lord's will for them to live? I think that's a very appropriate prayer. And if you're in that situation, have the same feeling. Do you recall a fellow by the name of Hezekiah and how he prayed and what God did? He gave him 15 more years of life. Praying to have your life extended as long as it's going to be used in a way that's pleasing and is beneficial and appropriate. Pray in a way that we will be showing God that he is first in our life is good. And there's nothing wrong with praying for a loved one that if it be the Lord's will, that their life be extended and some of the difficulties that they may face. I've read stories that people like to write tearjerker stories a lot that there was a man that every day went into a home and all the people in this particular home had serious cases of dementia and most of them died while they were there. 
Every day he walked into a room where his wife was and he left a nice red rose. And the nurse said to him one day, I don't want to offend you, but your wife doesn't know who you are. He said, I know that, but I know who she is. And that's what's important. And he went there every day because he cared for her and he wanted her to know, even if she didn't understand, he still wanted to honor her. That's the kind of attitude we need to have. The Lord's covenant with David and Israel's afflictions. God makes a covenant with each of us. That is, if you walk in the light as I am in the light, we're going to have a fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, my son, will cleanse you from all your sins. What a great and wonderful blessing to know that we're not like a light switch. We're saved, lost, saved, lost. It doesn't work that way. If we're in Christ and we sin, we need to correct it. But if a person is trying to live a good life and they still are sinning, that's where grace comes in and God's going to bless the people if they are added to the body of Christ and, and they're serving as they should. There's some great, wonderful benefits that we have. When others suffered, David was blessed because he tried to do right. Yes, we know what he did with Bathsheba, and we know about the child dying. But you notice what he said? I have sinned when Nathan pointed out, thou art the man, and David changed radically. And he was known as a man after God's own heart. Have that kind of an attitude and be pleasing. As we continue with the lesson and some of the other thoughts from the book of Psalms, just consider how God's eternity and the brevity of human life. We look at people in here and, and nobody's really old. You might say, well, I'm in my 80s, I'm old. Well, compared to eternity, 80 is not even hardly breaking the barrier. It's such a young age, nobody thinks of that. We can look back and some of us are into our second childhood now, I guess, and as a result of that, we can remember what it was like and we can even regress back to that. But have you ever really thought about how 80 or 90, even 100 is not all that old? I had a great aunt that was 106 when she died and her son never, lived, never married and he lived with her. He died six months later, he was 90 years old. She was 16 when he was born. She walked to a grocery store and got a loaf of bread and a small bunch of bananas. Came back home, put them on the kitchen table, sat down on her chair that she sat in and just died. No pain, she just literally died. What a way to go, she wore out. And six months later, her, husband, her son rather died. And we'd say, wow, 106, she lived a good life. Well, it's not necessarily the length of the life, it's the quality of the way we've lived. Well, I think she did live a good life, but, but nothing is all that great of, in today's society. And James tells us in chapter 4, what is your life? It's like a vapor. It appears and then it's gone. Those of you that fix tea or cook food, have you ever noticed how steam just shows up and then it disappears? That's what our life is like. We're like a mist or a vapor. We're here and it's gone. Eternity has no beginning has no ending. We just can't even imagine what eternity is like. It's just beyond us. But it always has been and always will be. And so we must make sure that we're ready to enter into eternity in a way that's pleasing. The security of one who is in the Lord. We get upset and rightfully so for those that teach once you're saved, you're always saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. But the Bible does teach once you're saved, you never have to be lost. And so that's the key. If I obey the gospel and I try to live a faithful life, I don't ever have to be lost. That doesn't mean I won't sin. That doesn't mean I won't repent. But it means I can have this close fellowship with God and, and not be separated from him. And that's a very important part of life. The theme here was make sure that you're secure in the Lord. And if you would die today, that heaven would be your home. Praise for the Lord's goodness. Jeff leads a lot of praise songs when he, he leads singing here. And that's good because we ought to be praising God and thanking him for what he has done and acknowledging all the wonderful blessings that we have in life. But praise is more than just saying things. It's showing gratitude. 
I recall one time at a preacher's meeting in India, all the preachers were fighting with each other, and not literally, but in heated arguments. The jealousy was prevailing, and they were trying to figure out how much each one got in support and make sure they were equal or above everybody else. And so I just stopped the meeting and had them all sit down. And I preached a lesson about cooperation, about respect, about consideration. And they all took notes and they thanked me very much. And the man came up and said, that's exactly what we needed to hear. This lesson is a life-changing lesson for us. Five minutes later, they were right back in a heated discussion arguing again. You see, they didn't understand praise or goodness. They said it, but they didn't live it. And that's an important part for us, is make sure when we say things, we really mean it. When we say it was good, believe it. Have any of you ever said something to a person that's not exactly correct? Maybe they fixed some food and it was very untasty, if that's the right word to use. It didn't have a good taste at all. And you say to them, they said, what do you think of this meal? And say, oh, this is great. Well, here, let me get you another helping. And it was, oh, no, no. But that's how we do sometimes with God. We say things, but we don't mean them. Let's praise him and show how grateful we are for his goodness. I'd suggest to you that the majesty of the Lord, we sing about that, majesty employs royalty. When Queen Elizabeth is in her room, they say, her majesty, the queen. And it's the idea of somebody that's highly respected. We don't have kings and queens in our country at least, I don't think we do. But it's the point that for majesty is realizing that God is above all of us and we should give him honor and glory and praise and respect. And his majesty is so great that it's going to cause us to do some things that we need to think about. And one is, whatever the Lord says, do, do, and don't question it. Even if we disagree with it, do it because he's right. And as we go on, we're going to understand that. Have any of you parents ever used this line with your children? Because I said so. Any of you ever said that to your children? If not, you need to make sure you come forward when we send and sing the invitation song. But it's the point that we all say that. And you know what that means, because I said so? It means because I know where you're going. I've gone through this, and it's not the right decision. You do what I say. When we come up with this and we understand how God loves us, then we're going to show majesty because he tells us how to live. and Whatever he says, we do. We totally submit. And what a wonderful blessing. Then he will take care of us and he will provide for us. Praise for the Lord against the unbelief. There are people that just do not believe in God. Sometimes even among us, we don't always believe. Sometimes I think the I know that the nicest, kindest, gentlest people in all the world are in the Lord's church. I also know the most bitter, evil, and frustrating people in all the world are in the Lord's church. And sometimes we're one of the other, maybe both. But it's the point that we need to make sure that we don't allow unbelief to become part of us. Believe in God even when it's difficult. Our granddaughter, Cassie, was born in 1999. <clears throat> and just before she was born or just after she was born, I don't recall, she was a, a small child anyway at the time, our daughter invited Brad and Misty Bernal to the house. And you don't know Brad or Misty Bernal, but you'll recall this in a moment. Many of you may remember the Columbine shooting that was the first major shooting in our country. And there was a young girl there, and they said, do you believe in God? And she said, yes. Or do you believe in Jesus? And said, yes. And they shot her in the head and killed her. Her name was Cassie Bernal, the daughter of Brad and Misty. And she wrote a book, Misty did, called She Said Yes. Our daughter asked him, is it okay with you if we name our daughter Cassie in honor of your daughter for what she did? And he said, yes, you can do that. That idea of caring for her was so great. Sometimes... We stand up in unbelief. If Cassie would have said, I don't believe in Jesus, it's just fictional. Probably they wouldn't have shot her. But because she said, I do believe, she was assassinated. I wonder about you and about me. Do we really believe? And somebody said, do you believe? I hope we would say yes and, and tell them why we believe. 
Think about the prayers that we have and how the afflicted man prays for mercy on himself and on Zion. When we're afflicted, we ask God to bless us. My brother-in-law told me recently that he developed shingles around the middle of his chest. And for one month, he wasn't able to sleep hardly at all because they were halfway around the body from the midsection all the way to the back. He said, no matter how I lay, I'm in pain. I can't walk much because it causes me trouble. I can't sit in a chair. I just finally pass out from exhaustion. And he was in terrible, terrible pain. He said, I've never prayed so much in my life and I've never had so much pain in my life. The shingles have gone away. And now he's on a, a three week extended dirt bike trail and they've covered 9,000 miles so far on a dirt bike coming back to Arkansas from Colorado. But it's the point that he was in terrible pain and he said, I prayed more in the last month than I prayed my entire life because of this pain. And I prayed not only for me, but for anybody else that suffered in this way. And sometimes the Lord has to give us a wake up call. When things occur and we've, we realize this isn't really about me, it's about all of us and some of the blessings that we have. I think again of how we pray for the Lord's mercies. His mercies are gracious and they're forever. What about you and what about me? Do we pray for God's mercies to be extended to us? Mercy is not just the name of our daughter-in-law. Mercy means that God is going to provide grace and blessings for us and some of the wonderful joys that we have of being his children. If God is merciful to us, shouldn't we be merciful to others? You remember how Jesus pointed out about the Samaritan and how he did some wonderful things for the Jewish man that was beaten? That helped him to realize there were some real blessings. We're nearly getting done with some of these thoughts, so just stay with me for a few more moments. The Lord is one who cares over all of his works. Everything that we do, God notices and he cares about it. It's important to us. I mentioned to you about a man who was at Clear Lake when I was preaching one Sunday night and the Lord's table was, be, was in front of me over there, but the lid was not exactly right, it was angled. And I was preaching, he just could not handle that. And so he got up and he was sitting back about where Dennis is and he sauntered down to the front of the auditorium while I was preaching and he took that tray lid and he put it on right, did this and went back and sat down but he could listen to the sermon that it was just tearing him up because he was OCD was so bad and he just couldn't stand that. And I laughed about that and I've used that in sermons and I've reminded him several times about that. And I said, I thought you were coming forward for me to baptize you. And I knew better than that, but every time I'd see him, I'd say, I've come to baptize you today. This past week he passed away somewhat unexpectedly, but it was the point that he had of saying, I trust in the Lord and, and everything that I do, I give God the glory for. And some of his works that seemed rather unimportant became very important because he gave God glory and the Lord used him in ways that he had never dreamed. The Lord is wonderful and he took care of Israel and what they needed. But he also will take care of us and what we need. If we trust in God, everything that we need is here. How many of you recall the passage, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? They've been talking about food and shelter and clothing. Everything that you need, God will provide. No, he doesn't promise you a, a beautiful mansion. He doesn't promise you the most expensive clothes. He doesn't promise you the most outgoing meals with the most expensive food. But he said there will be food, shelter, and clothing. And if you can't take care of it yourself, that's why you have brothers and sisters in Christ. They will help you. They will take care of you. There's not a person in here, if their house burned to the ground, that somebody wouldn't say, come and stay with us, at least for the night, so we can get you taken care of in some way. We would do that somehow or another, because we're family. and. When we understand this, then we'll realize how 
we should give God glory and that he will be pleased with all that we do. Israel's rebelliousness and the Lord's wonderful help. Have we ever rebelled against God? Are there things that we have done that God probably wouldn't be very pleased with? Probably all of us have done that sometime or another, and yet he's helped us through things. Are we like that little boy that got in trouble and said to his mother, you make me sit on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. You're not going to break my spirit. God says, when your spirit is broken and you trust in me, then I can take care of you and I can bless you. But we have to get to that point in life. <clears throat> the Lord is one that really cares about people and he rescues many from their problems. He will rescue people from the troubles that they have if they will trust in him and do what he says. David was one that really got himself in a lot of trouble, and yet every time God helped him get through it. Elijah was a, an example of somebody that destroyed all the prophets of Baal, and they went down to the river Kishon and they were put to death. And immediately he went out, and, and when he found out that there were people that were after him, he became very, very depressed. And the Lord said, rest and eat and rest and get up and get busy. Even when things seemed to be bad, God took care of him. And he did not allow others to cause him a lot of grief. So may I suggest to you then that, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm not doing something right. There we go. If you've never been baptized, today is the day. Don't put this off until tomorrow because tomorrow might never come. If you've been baptized and you've wandered away, come back home if that's needed, or if you want to become part of this congregation. When do we do that? The answer is right now. If there's anybody that has any kind of a need at all, now is the time to do that. We encourage you to please stand as together we sing. <clears throat> 